Hello, everyone. Welcome. That was a brief promotional video about generating change, a new initiative supporting nonprofit talent and leadership development for the nonprofit sector. I'll be talking more about it shortly. But first, I wanted to welcome you and share with you the goals for today's presentation, which include helping you to understand the critical importance of supporting nonprofit talent and leadership for the nonprofit sector for millennials, as well as for all generations, to help you see the um, pipeline of leadership needs across a, uh, one's career. And for this, I'm hoping that you think about this in a few different ways this is for yourself as a leader and where your needs are in the career pipeline. Um, secondly, for your staff, if you're a manager of a nonprofit organization, um, thinking about the leadership development needs of your staff and where they're at. And if you're a funder, either you work in a foundation or you're a donor, thinking about the leadership development needs of your grantees. I'm also hoping that you can gain some approaches for um, identifying funders and approaching them for um, funding for nonprofit leadership and talent development. So who am I? My name is Chris Putnam Walkerly, president of Putnam Community Investment Consulting. We're a national philanthropy consulting and evaluation firm. We work with foundations and nonprofits to help them design and develop new grant making initiatives to evaluate impact and to communicate results. We've worked with over 30 uh, foundations and nonprofits and over 60 client engagements, ranging from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, and most recently, Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy to develop the Generating Change Initiative. Uh, Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, or EPIP, is a national organization of foundation members that's um, purpose is to develop extraordinary new leaders in philanthropy and most recently launched this new initiative to also support leadership development in the nonprofit sector. Uh, generating change, I'll be talking about, as I mentioned throughout this presentation, um, is a terrific initiative. It includes a online toolkit for funders and nonprofit organizations. If you're online during this presentation, I encourage you to go to epip.org backslash genchange and to check out the toolkit and share your thoughts and ideas. You can also, if you're using Twitter, you can follow and use the hashtag GenChange during this presentation. So the big question is why support nonprofit talent and leadership development? Why is this so important? And there's five different reasons that I want to share with you um, as to why it is critical to support nonprofit talent and leadership development. The first is that foundations are truly only as effective as the grantees that they support. Foundations have many tools at their disposal. Um, the largest tool and the most obvious tool is money, is the money in forms of uh, grant investments in nonprofit organizations to help the foundation achieve its mission. Every foundation has a mission, has a, um, most have uh, strategies and goals of things they're trying to achieve, and they primarily achieve those goals and mission through grants to nonprofit organizations. Therefore, the foundations are really only as successful as their grantees, and the grantees, we believe, are only as successful as the talent of their staff and leadership. And therefore, we feel it's very important for foundations to support um, leadership. It's really in the, their best interest. And if you think about the billions of dollars that foundations are allocating toward programs and services and nonprofit capacity building projects, Again, it's in the foundation's best interest to ensure that the talent and the leadership that is leading those efforts um, is as prepared um, and developed as possible. The second reason is the economic impact that the nonprofit sector has in this uh, country. And these findings were actually quite surprising to me, and I think they'll be surprising to you too. Um, there are, in fact, uh, about 13.5 million people in the US working in the nonprofit sector. Uh, this comprises 10% of our workforce, which is actually larger than the finance sector. We earn 9% of our um, wages, and if you calculate the 1.8 billion volunteer hours, this adds up to about $169 million um, in revenue. So um, it's a huge um, part of our nation's economy, and when you think about it that way, then it's really incumbent upon us to make sure that the talent and the leadership is really top-notch and that resources are invested in talent and leadership development. The third reason is the retirement of baby boomers. About five or six years ago, there were lots of studies coming out, very credible studies indicating that um, there was about to be this huge exodus 
of baby boomers who are, would be retiring from nonprofit executive positions and that there weren't really enough people in um, lower level management positions to um, take up the slack and assume these executive director roles. And it was really billed as a crisis. Well, a few things have happened since then. One, the recession. So certainly people aren't retiring as quickly as they planned because they couldn't afford to. And secondly, there's actually been a huge shift in retirement in this country. Um, uh, recently, um, there's fewer people retiring due to things like just longevity, living longer, and fewer people wanting to retire. So this is really um, essentially a crisis deferred. It's not averted. And if that, in fact, there's been studies recently showing that Within the next five years, about 67% of executive anticipate leaving their executive roles. So what this means is that you don't just have executive directors that are leaving organizations and a need for the next in command to assume that role, but when that next in command assumes the senior leadership role, then supervisors and mid-level managers will be moving into those um, associate director, for example, positions, and so on. And so you really have a shift and potential for um, growth uh, of, of workers from all levels of nonprofit organizations filling these roles um, as the senior leaders are leaving. So a fourth reason why it's critical to support nonprofit leadership and talent development is because there's a large um, lack of diversity in the nonprofit sector of ethnic diversity and a disparity between um, the leadership and the staff and communities that are being served. This isn't just a lack of diversity among executive positions, but also among board members. For example, there was a National Urban Institute study in 2005 indicating that 86% of nonprofit boards are white, and that in fact in 45% um, of nonprofit boards located in urban metropolitan areas, there were no people of color on the boards of directors. There isn't really a lot of national data describing the diversity, um, ethnic diversity, of nonprofit organization staff. However, there have been a few statewide and uh, local studies done that are very credible, one in California, one in the Baltimore area, each indicating that uh, among the nonprofits surveyed, about half are people of color, yet only about 25% of um, senior leadership positions, executive positions, and board members were people of color. So there's certainly, um, this has been a persistent problem, it's a continuous problem that needs to be addressed, there needs to be greater efforts in recruiting, retaining, developing, and advancing people of color into leadership positions in the nonprofit sector. And then a fifth reason is I will share with you a video uh, from the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund, which highlights um, some of the voices of nonprofit executive directors who have themselves participated in leadership programs, explaining why um, their participation was very helpful to them personally for their leadership um, and in turn how it helped their organizations and the work that they're doing in communities. Uh, some of these individuals are millennials, some of them are more seasoned leaders, but I think what's interesting is that um, there's a lot for leaders to learn even if they've been working successfully in this field for 10, 20, um, even 25 or so years. I thought I was a perfectly fine leader. I thought I was doing a great job. We've grown, staff seem to like working here. We didn't have any kind of management structure. We didn't have a management team. We didn't have senior team meetings. Um, we just, we really just did the work. You know, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And um, the idea that I could learn something sitting in a conference room with a bunch of other executive directors or working with a consultant who did um, management training or development. As a younger um, executive director of color, sort of the next generation um, leadership cohort um, who was inheriting uh, a pretty influential or local community organization from um, sort of a baby boomer white woman who was very established, uh, very charismatic, had made a very strong stamp on the organization. I had the challenge of establishing myself as a credible leader of the organization while I was changing the organization at the same time. And for me, what's important as part of my leadership is to share that leadership um, with my team and my board. But I think that's also what I'm learning is that, um, that I thrive best as a leader in collaboration.
think in the beginning, my leadership challenge was really um, delegation. I tried to really take on everything on my own, you know, kind of the standard executive director role. And I really, um, over the years, have learned how important it is to have a really strong team around you. I did a lot of work on with a coach on how to kind of expand the toolbox of, of st leadership styles available to me. And it's not that I didn't have these other styles, but I wasn't always using them. And so now I've really learned how to refine kind of when to use, uh, in, in very limited fashion, when to use that pace setting style and when to use more consensus building, um, motivational, inspirational styles of leadership that has yielded incredible results. I'm learning really hard skills about how to navigate some of these situations, how to deal with these tough situations and deal with people who are resistant to me. Not necessarily personally, but oftentimes just what I represent. I think this is typical for a lot of first-time EDs. Is in the first year, I had to actually do cuts. So there were very specific challenges around intergenerational. There were multicultural dynamics. There were just our own development as women having to confront people of all different, uh, you know, identities with what they need, what we need from them. It was very, very challenging. There are so few LGBT people of color within this movement that are in leadership positions. And then those who are in leadership positions have a whole host of unique challenges that go along with that. And to have a, a cohort of individuals who kind of know your same experiences and can relate to them and have some best practices to how to navigate through some of those challenges has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, you know, I think that in most organizations, if you're a person of color, you start off with what the President Obama said is a deficit of trust. And so, you know, you always have to constantly prove yourself. In so many ways, um, really realizing that actually the more I bring the more of me, um, more of my intellect, more of my heart, more of my relationships um, in the world, the better it actually is for my leadership. If you want to invest in making change in our country, you need to invest in people. And I feel like in our culture we tend to separate the two. There's sort of a pot of work and objectives and outcomes, and then there's this leadership development stuff. More funders need to understand that the work flows from the leadership. And so investing in leadership is investing in the work. So the fact that these funders have come together and have said, you know, we see the value in you and we see the value in your presence in this movement and that you should be leaders in this movement is really profound and I'm very grateful. So then the question is, how do we tackle the challenge of nonprofit leadership and talent development? Well, one of the things that we've done is to develop a nonprofit talent and leadership pipeline. And this really is a way to frame our initiative and frame our thinking around supporting nonprofit talent and leadership development across a career pipeline, ranging from recruitment of people into the nonprofit sector all the way to re-engaging retired leaders um, who want to stay involved in different ways. Um, this isn't really rocket science, it's not anything new, but it's a way of organizing um, the pipeline to help foundations, for example, see where they might want to support nonprofit leadership and to help um, individual nonprofit organizations and leaders see um, where they fit in the pipeline and um, kind of where they want to focus their efforts. So as you can see from this visual here, um, there's lots of gray lines and orange lines and dotted lines, and that's really meant to convey that there's no one clear path. There's really no one direct line through for somebody's career. It doesn't usually start at the very beginning and seamlessly move toward retirement. Certainly people enter the nonprofit sector at different times in their lives, some after college, some in their 40s. Some people work in the nonprofit sector for 20 years and pause to raise a family or to work in academia or someplace else and might come back. Um, but we wanted to show that there is, um, on the aggregate, in this sector as well as any sector, any part of the workforce, there's a way to think about building that pipeline um, across the career lifespan. And so this is divided into three areas. The first is filling the leadership pipeline and thinking about ways to fill the pipeline with talented people in the nonprofit sector who um, are the right people for the right job. The second is developing and harnessing leadership talent, really thinking about how do we optimize the talent that we have in the sector and really help advance that talent. 
And the last is thinking about transitioning um, seasoned leaders and re-engaging leaders. So as people are perhaps at midlife um, in their 50s um, who are, have been working in nonprofit um, leadership positions for many years, who are kind of already at the pinnacle, what, what do they do next? What are their encore careers? Um, what are the opportunities for people who have retired who want to stay in the sector? So that's really the, the career pipeline as we've laid it out. And again, you can think about this in three different ways for yourself, for your organization, and for the organizations you support as a funder or as a donor. So what I want to talk to you about is the first three components of the nonprofit pipeline, recruitment, retention, and development, because these are really the ones that are most appropriate for millennials based upon their age and stage in their career. I will touch on the other four as well because it's important to think about your entire career pipeline. Um, recruitment is really all the different activities needed to help build awareness about the nonprofit sector as a viable career option and to help people find appropriate jobs for themselves and to stay in the sector as a whole for their career. Um, interestingly, the nonprofit sector is actually um, currently positioned pretty well to recruit new talent, especially into more entry level jobs. Um, currently, um, College graduates under the age of 25 face the worst job prospects in over 60 years. Um, there are, I think in 2007, there were, was an unemployment rate for this population of 5.4%, and that jumped to 9.3% in 2010. So you have a, um, a lot of young college-educated people looking for work. And interestingly, the nonprofit sector fared pretty well during the recession. It didn't, um, there was not that much job loss as compared to the for-profit sector. Um, in fact, the nonprofit sector grew by 2.5%, whereas the for-profit sector declined by 0.6%. So you have lots of college-educated young people looking for work and a sector that, on the whole, in the aggregate, nationally, fared well and has lots of jobs available. Now, certainly for certain sectors of the, of the nonprofit industry um, and certain parts of the country, um, it's a different story. But I think that's worth noting. Um, also, um, one of the biggest challenges really facing the nonprofit sector in terms of recruitment is that there's no clear pathway for anybody to understand, to learn about the nonprofit sector and to understand their um, possible career pathways and what they need to do to get ahead, to advance, to take on management positions, to become an executive director. Um, I think if many of you, if you think back upon your first nonprofit job, you probably stumbled upon it and stumbled into the sector and decided to give it a go. And there really are better ways of going about that. For example, other industries like accounting, for example, would um, there be more clear paths for a um, college student studying, account studying accounting to see what they might do, uh, what they could expect in terms of pay and salary and how they might advance. Um, and that really doesn't exist in the nonprofit sector. So there's a lot more that we can do um, in terms of strategic um, HR practices, strategic uh, awareness building, and um, recruitment strategies, both within individual organizations, because I think about a third of nonprofit organizations have a dedicated HR um, staff person, and across the sector as a whole. Um, one organization that's been doing a good job of this is the Cleveland Foundation. They um, decided to tackle this by creating an internship program aimed at college students uh, who are from the Cleveland area, and they work to pair them up with nonprofits in the Cleveland area. They um, find uh, and pair nonprofit organizations with uh, 17 paid interns for the summer. This has been going on for a few years, and they've had 180 college students go through this program. It's featured as one of the case studies in our toolkit, and there's a, a graphic there that you can see the case study, and you can go on to epip.org backslash genchange and look at the toolkit and find this case study on recruitment. Um, and I'm gonna share with you now um, a video of Nelson Beckford of the Cleveland Foundation talking about how this internship program has had an impact on the interns themselves and helped them to attract new talent to the nonprofit sector. The Cleveland Foundation has an, we have an internship program because about 13 years ago, we were receiving calls from members of the community wanting to intern here at the Cleveland Foundation. And because our purpose is to serve the greater Cleveland area, we decided it would be best to work with our nonprofit partners, 
provide them with funding to host the intern. And we know that our nonprofit partners are very, very busy. And in addition to providing the grants, we also help with a lot of the heavy lifting that comes with finding quality talent. Um, this means recruiting the students, conducting the first round of interviews, and then sending finalists to the organizations for them to make the decision. Oh, wow, what makes me the proudest? Meeting with young people that have you know, lived in Cleveland their whole lives and then go away to college and then come back and almost rediscovering their city and seeing, um, the, seeing the, the assets of the community that when they were here, they didn't have a chance to explore. Um, having them discover neighborhoods they've never been to and really understand the depth and breadth of the Cleveland nonprofit community. Um, another, I guess, thing I'm more proud of is that these students, these young people, see their community in a whole different light, and they see the opportunity here. They see that they could really, really make a difference in a way they probably could not make in New York or Chicago. On the larger level, we to date, we have um, about 208 interns that have been through the program, and I have, I could go on and on and on about the interns that are in leadership positions with organizations from, wow, Victor Ruiz, who is the executive director at um, Esperanza, to um, Stephen Love, who is a project manager at the Cuyahoga Land Bank, to Carrie Miller, who is the director at the City Club Cleveland. I could go on and on and on. So, so, so to see the program have that kind of reach, for them to see the opportunity in the nonprofit world and to, to have them want to give back to their community, um, that's been the high point for me. Using myself as an example, um, my background and training is in business, and I've always always believed in giving back. But um, when I was in my undergrad, I my understanding of a nonprofit was non-profit, so no money. Um, and I was very turned off to that. Um, as I grew and I became you know, older, I, I saw the value in contributing, making the world a better place. So I think the biggest challenge is, is attracting folks from different disciplines into the field. Um, so folks from the marketing world, the finance world, the IT world, to see that there's opportunity for them in the nonprofit arena, to, for them to see that those expertise and those skills um, are needed in the nonprofit arena. So I think that's the biggest challenge. My advice um, to other funders and other partners that are interested in setting up an internship program is to, 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 to be um, conscious of the two customers you're appealing to, um, one, young people. And it's just, it's, it's much, much more than um, recruiting them and placing them. Um, you also have to spend time um, developing them and giving them access to whatever networks you're a part of. Um, for the nonprofit, um, we're always clear that, again, in addition to having a project that stretches them and that's meaningful, that they also have to invest in their development. Um, and the other thing I would say is, is maintain relationships with them. Once the internship is over, um, keep contact because these are future leaders. So the next component that I want to talk to you about is retention. Um, retention is really any effort to engage and retain uh, emerging leaders and seasoned uh, professionals within nonprofit organizations and within the sector as a whole. So any effort to help motivate, um, inspire, challenge, and engage people in their jobs and in the sector. Um, voluntary turnover within nonprofit organizations is a huge problem. In fact, there's been a couple of studies, um, most recently in Ready to Leave in 2008, found that 70% um, of people of color and 64% of whites, leaders, uh, did not anticipate being in their job within the next three years. And the year prior, the YNPN, the Young Nonprofit Professionals Network, did a study, and of those nonprofit workers who had been in their jobs for at least four years, 45% of them anticipated no longer working within that organization or the nonprofit sector within the next um, year. So there's um, this a lot of data indicating that there's a lot of turnover, and those of us who work in the nonprofit sector certainly have experienced turnover. 
Um, it's a big problem. It's a very expensive problem. It's um, estimated that the direct cost of hiring replacement workers in nonprofits is upwards of 50 to 60 percent of the person's annual salary. And that's the direct cost. That doesn't include the indirect costs, things like um, the time of HR staff, the um, lost uh, productivity in work teams, um, the delays of deadlines and projects that employee was working on, um, challenges to staff morale if several workers are leaving at the same time. So it's a big problem. Um, and the other big issue is that there's um, you know, a challenge, as I mentioned earlier, as the baby boomers are retiring, um, if there aren't lots of people in that pipeline within the organization to take on um, the new roles that will come about as the executive director leaves, because of that turnover, then the organizations themselves have a difficulty promoting from within or hiring from across the sector to fill those roles. So one way to approach this is for organizations to develop their own um, programs designed to retain their employees and develop their employees and prepare them for more senior leadership roles. And in fact, the National Urban League did just this with the support of, the, um, of American Express, which provides a great deal of funding for nonprofit leadership development programs across the country. Um, national Urban League is a national organization. It's been around for over 100 years, but they have almost 100 affiliate organizations all over the country. And what they were finding was that um, they didn't have, as those um, CEO roles were opening up in those affiliates, they didn't always have the staff in place to move into these senior roles. And so they created this program called the Emerging Leaders Program, and it's highlighted as a case study on the Generating Change Toolkit. And um, basically it provides leadership development, coaching, um, mentoring, and support for um, emerging leaders across their affiliate organizations to prepare themselves for senior roles in um, those affiliate organizations or for the national organization itself. So you can learn more about this as an example of a way to address the retention issue um, on the Generating Change website. And also there are two videos, one highlighting Richard Brown from American Express describing why he feels that it's important for American Express to support leadership development and leadership retention and Wanda Jackson from the National Urban League discussing um, why this um, program was really important for their organization for it to um, move forward into the next century. So the third area that I want to talk with you a little bit more in depth about as it relates to millennials is the pipeline component of development. And this is really the component that you'll find most leadership development programs fall into. It's really any effort to um, build the capacity and enhance the abilities of nonprofit workers, emerging leaders, um, established leaders. Um, there are a few things to consider in development. Um, these listed, these bullet points listed below are really some of the best practices for um, developing or choosing a development program. One is that the development efforts should are best when they're part of a system. So they should be ongoing parts of a leadership development system throughout the organization or across the sector and not be episodic. Um, it's ideal if there's a mix of in context, meaning on the job, and out of context, meaning things like retreats or um, classroom or learning communities, things like that. Um, leadership development programs that are grounded in um, succession management. So there's an eye toward thinking about um, succession for the organization as different leaders um, either move up or move out of the organization. And so you're positioning people for certain roles. Uh, development programs ideally should provide on-the-job training and support, as well as um, involve their own self-assessment and support and uh, challenges, um, stretch assignments, things like that to support their work. Um, leadership development uh, really focuses on two main areas. One is um, te developing technical competencies. So these are um, competencies needed to manage known problems or pro anticipated problems things like improving cost efficiency of programs, as well as adaptive competencies. So these are things um, uh, that aren't anticipated or that the solutions aren't necessarily known. So identifying emerging needs in a community and designing brand new interventions to meet those needs, for example. So leadership development should really include both kinds of competencies. 
So one development program that I want to highlight that's part of our case study in the Generating Change Initiative is the 21st Century Fellowship Program, which is part of the Pipeline Project. The Pipeline Project, along with its funders, the Evelyn Walter Haas Jr. Fund, Arcus Foundation, and the Gill Foundation, recognized that there was a lack of ethnic diversity in LGBT organizations, lesbian, gay, bi, transgender organizations at the national level working to advance the national LGBT movement. So they designed a year-long fellowship program working with emerging leaders who are working in LGBT organizations around the country who are people of color and helping position them for senior leadership roles in national LGBT organizations. Um, as a result, there's been a tremendous number of people that have participated in this program and they've conducted a lot of evaluation indicating that many of those individuals have in fact um, stayed within the sector and advanced um, into in their own, own organizations as well as to other organizations nationally. So those were the first three components of the nonprofit talent and leadership pipeline that are most relevant for millennials. But I do want to share with you briefly the next four components and touch upon them because they are relevant um, to think about across one's career pipeline. The next is realignment, which is any effort to reorganize, restructure, realign nonprofit organizations to adopt new leadership styles, often shared leadership practices to engage leadership development across all staffing levels of organizations, including the board of directors. And we highlight a um, example of the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund supporting Compass Point, where a new um, executive director took over after a long time and well-respected executive director left. And the um, new practices that she implemented as she refocused the mission of the organization and um, developed and advanced more younger um, leaders within the organization um, and provided new leadership development opportunities for her staff. The next is renewal, which is really any effort to prevent burnout uh, within the nonprofit sector, which can be um, staggering because the challenges are so great and the funding is so hard to come by. Renewal could include anything such as a, a retreat. Uh, often it's a sabbatical program, and in fact, we highlight the Derpy Foundation uh, sabbatical program as a case study and their support in particular for Arturo Vargas, who is the executive director of NALIO, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, and how the sabbatical really helped him in his work and in developing management teams um, within his organization and changing how they um, work together. So the sixth component of the pipeline is supporting executive transition and su succession planning. Um, this is really thinking about in advance the succession planning and transition planning for seasoned executive directors. People can't be executive directors forever. At some point, they're going to leave. And it's better to plan for that and have everyone on board um, and to think about um, when that will be happening and how to have the right systems in place, the right people in place to take over when that executive leaves, how to think about um, filling that position, what the needs are. And for this, um, one great example is the NA Casey Foundation, which has done a lot of work helping identify uh, best practices and strategies for nonprofit succession planning. And we highlight in the toolkit um, the case study of their support for advocacy for children and youth in Maryland when a new executive director took over for a longtime executive director in a time of challenge for the organization and how their funding um, and the consulting support that they provided really helped that new leader um, take over and help the organization grow. Um, and lastly, re-engagement. This is really any effort to re-engage um, more seasoned leaders who aren't ready to retire or retired um, nonprofit leaders back into the sector, either into encore careers, a different kind of career in the sector, or into different roles, perhaps coaching or author, becoming an author or a volunteer or a board member or a coach, for example. People who want to stay in the sector, um, maybe who've retired but want to stay involved. And so for this, we highlight um, the Field Foundation support for Executive Service Corps of Chicago. They have a program that um, trains interim executive directors, people who used to be executive directors who are now retired but want to come back and play an interim role to help um, nonprofit organizations that are in transition and they're in between executive directors. 
So that is an overview of the nonprofit career pipeline. And I want to share with you a little bit about uh, different ideas for how you can get involved. Um, the first uh, is to check out the Generating Change Toolkit. There's all kinds of resources. There's a framing paper that highlights recent research and recommendations and practical ideas and strategies for supporting nonprofit leadership development. There's case studies that I've mentioned, videos, um, blogs, opportunities for conversation, and a whole lot of resources. And you can check that out at epip.org backslash genchange. Um, there's also some suggestions for engaging your, fund, your funders in this work. Um, the first is I really want to advise you, having worked in the field of philanthropy for 12 years, is that um, you should feel very comfortable talking to your existing foundations, letting them know about your organization's leadership development needs and talent development needs, and asking their advice. Um, even before you ask for money, ask for suggestions. Um, do they, are they aware of local um, leadership development programs in your area? Um, do they have suggestions of ways that they could be supportive or other organizations could be supportive of what you're trying to accomplish? And of course, um, you know, share the Generating Change Toolkit with them. Um, help them see that there are lots of foundations that are interested in supporting this, who believe in the value of the nonprofit organizations and the talent of the grantees that they're supporting and realize that um, their grants are only as effective as the talent of the people that are implementing them. There's another national effort um, underway called the Initiative for Nonprofit Talent and Leadership Development, which is um, being organized through the independent sector. And um, the website is independentsector.org backslash leadership initiative. Um, and basically, that's just another way that foundations can see that there is really a, a movement underway to support nonprofit talent and leadership development. And then lastly, you can identify new funders by the Foundation Center. If you're not familiar with the Foundation Center, I highly recommend it. Um, they have a national online direct searchable directory of foundations that you can search by geography or topic or issue area. If your organization doesn't subscribe to this directory, um, there are many, uh, in fact, there's hundreds of cooperating collections across the country, libraries and cities across the country that have access to this database that you can use for free. So you can go onto their website to see if there's a cooperating collection near you. I also encourage you to use a few different resources to find nonprofit leadership development programs that might be appropriate for you or your staff or your grantees. The first is the Leadership Learning Community, and they have a, provi a searchable provider directory at leadershiplearning.org. And then, of course, Generating Change um, website has a um, listing of resources and links, which include many leadership development programs that you can check out. So lastly, I encourage you to learn more and to contact us. Um, you can learn more about generating change and leadership development for the nonprofit sector at epip.org backslash genchange. And you can follow um, generating change on Twitter using the hashtag genchange. You're also welcome to contact me. My email address is kputnam at putnamcic.com or our website, putnamcic.com. Our blog is philanthropy411.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at philanthropy411. Thank you very much, and good luck to you.